All right, you've all got the notes in front of you. You have got a copy of this. You're looking at page three. And the question you could get on an exam is be asked to draw the graph, Jan, for any type of uh, conductor and be asked to state the charge carriers are. So what I have done here, you're, you're given a set number of conductors, metallic, filament full, ionic, gases, vacuum, and semiconductors. Right? So you've all got that chart on page three of your notes. Yes? So what we've got to do, I'll just fill in the chart here, but you've got it there already. Karina, you will have to remember what the graph looks like, remember what the charge carriers look like, and funnily enough, I don't think you actually have to know the explanation. Although, as I see, it would be ridiculous to expect you to know all of this without knowing the explanation. Right? But I think the syllabus doesn't actually expect this, but I would, I mean, it seems very difficult to remember the graph without knowing the explanation. And it brings everything else uh, into focus if we can. So we're going to run through it very quickly. Um, so if I just fill them in here as I go along, am I able to type here? I, I can now write on it. Uh, right, metallic conductor, I'll be editing this little bit out of it. Um, again, which goes on the x-axis, which goes on the y-axis? The current on the y and the voltage on the x. Yeah, the bit that we control goes on the x-axis, we control the v. So basically, the, that's the graph over here. It's going to be v on that axis, i there. And what's the graph going to look like? Straight line through the origin. Basically, what you've got is a metallic conductor. And if you apply a potential difference to this conductor here, you're basically pushing the electrons along. The greater the potential difference, the more the electrons are going to move, yeah, the greater the current will be. Well, we just said, because the bit that we control goes on the x-axis. Has it not got anything to do with the V equals IR thing? When you use V equals IR, when you calculate the slope, and the slope has a significance, then we will go back and say, well, I'm using V equals I R in this case, and my general equation for a line is what? Y equals M X. So I should put this around, change this, and say V equals R I. Therefore, I say if if I'm going to calculate the slope, and the slope has a significance, then you must be wary of what goes on what axis. So here I would say, hang on, if I put V on the Y axis and I on the X axis, well then the resistance will correspond to the slope of the graph. So if you're looking at a mathematical sum, you've got to be wary of it. So there's two conventions, that's one. The other is that generally you put what you control on the x-axis, and the bit that you don't goes on the y-axis. And that's why you say y is a function of x. So over here, generally, I'll try pushing the electrons around by applying a voltage, a potential difference. How many electrons actually move is a function of how hard I push. It's also a function of the resistance itself. So generally, I would put v on the x-axis, I in the way. No way, then the slope is equal to 1 over v. In that case, the slope would be equal to 1 over v. Actually, I don't see how it should be different. How would it be different? <coughs> You'd still get a straight line through the origin. You would get, it'd still look like this. But in this case, the resistance would correspond to 1 over the slope if I had those two variables changed. Okay? Would you lose marks if in the exam you did it like v equals ir? Not for here, because in both cases you get a straight line. But for some of these down later on, you will see it'll actually change things. Okay, so we'll see uh, a filament bulb. What's the graph look like for a filament bulb? It goes up a small bit and then it's got a curve and it goes up. It goes up and then it tends to plateau over like that. Why does it plateau? Because it, the resistance goes up to its height for the current to increase. Why does its resistance go? Because it heats up. Okay, because it heats up. So you've got more atoms jiggling up and down, so it's harder for electrons to get from one place to another. So the greater the current, the greater the resistance, therefore, yeah, the greater the current, the greater the resistance, therefore the less further increase in current you're going to get. Okay, that's that guy there. Charge carriers in each case are electrons, and electrons couldn't be easier. Okay, Jan? Ionic solutions, active electrodes, in this case it's the copper ions. This is the experiment that you did the last day. Once again, you've got V, you've got I, and what graph should you have got? Straight line to the origin. And if you wrote it up, and if you plotted it, you really should have got that, because it is very, very straightforward. But in this case, what's actually moving, remember you've got the copper, is coming off of the anode, it's going into solution, it's losing electrons, so it goes into the solution. So it's no longer a neutral copper atom, it's now a copper ion. 
and then the copper ion comes out of solution, CUSO4, and goes into the copper electrode on the other side. So what's moving here are, in this case, the copper ions, which are positive ions, and also the electrons are going the other way. Okay? So what you mean, you just have to know what's happening. The copper ions are discharged at the cathode and are replaced by copper ions entering the solution as ions in the anode. Again, I don't think you have to know all of that, but you do have to know these two down here. Are they discharged at the anode and they go to the cathode? Discharged at the probably at the it Hebrew. builds up on the cathode. Yeah, yeah. So that should be anode there, and it should be the other way around. Yeah. Uh, this one here we haven't done, so we just do it purely in theory. So it's copper ions discharged the anode. Discharged at the yeah, that should be the anode. I double checked that in the textbook, but I think that's right. They're leaving the anode. Just yeah, you can check it later on. This bit here we haven't come across before, so you're just going to learn it. There's no, nothing else to it. We don't do an experiment. We don't verify it. What happens if you've got inactive electrodes? In this case, inactive might be something like platinum. You have two platinum electrodes. Stick them in water or stick them in, in any of these guys here. What did I say here? Uh, no, I didn't give the... Uh, oxygen is produced at the anode. So in this case, it's assuming that what's going on is water and it's hydrolysis of water. Two platinum electrodes. And what goes on here is when the oxygen is produced, it actually hangs around the anode and it builds up at the anode. And as a result, to get ions moving, you actually have to overcome what is effectively a small little barrier. So it's like a potential difference. You have got to be greater than that potential difference to get the electrons away from the anode. So therefore, you won't get current moving until the potential difference is greater than a certain amount like that. And after that, so it will be a straight line. So it doesn't go to the origin? Correct. Okay. But basically, you've got to have a little bit of a voltage to overcome the small little amount of oxygen that's building up at the end. I don't know anything about the chemistry beyond that, but that's what you've got to know, and that's the full diagram you've got to give up. Okay? Uh, let's get out of that guy, see if this one works. We'll come down as far as here. Teleconductor, ionic solution, inactive. Yes, the last three now get a little bit tricky.